Good morning, um, and thank you everyone for signing up to today's webinar. My name is David Gallagher, uh, and I'm a partner in Brody's commercial services team, specialising in international licensing deals and commercial contracts within the life and chemical sciences sector. And today I have the, the pleasure of introducing Mike Stevenson from Thinktastic, who will be talking to us today about a topic that is particularly pertinent in the current climate, crisis recovery. It's a topic that Mike excels at speaking about with verve and authenticity gained from personal experience, from sleeping rough on the streets of London to becoming an award-winning entrepreneur. With 30 years as a marketing professional under his belt, Mike previously founded Heatwise Glasgow and Design Links Marketing Agency, which within a few years grew to a business with a turnover in excess of one million. Mike today will touch on the use of colour, ambitions for Scotland, trends for the future, and the importance of collaboration. And having had the pleasure of hearing some of Mike's anecdotes yesterday, I have to say you're all in for a treat over the next hour. His stories, grounded in reality, are truly inspirational, humorous and insightful, and very few people are better at motivating and changing mindsets. So ladies and gentlemen, it's with great pleasure that I hand you over to the founder of Thinktastic, Mike Stevenson. Good morning, and thank you so much for, for joining me today. Um, I, I, I got a great introduction there and I'm absolutely flattered. So I've got to try and live up to that now. I want to go back to um, a situation in my earlier life that really has you know, laid a foundation for what I do today and how I think today. And it is um, the moment at Kirkcaldy High School um, when I was asked to uh, leave the school, um, pretty unceremoniously. I was at school with Gordon Brown, incidentally. Um, and he was in one of these accelerated classes, you know, applying for university when he was 12 and a half. I was in what you would call a decelerating class. And anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up sleeping out in the streets of London. And whilst I would never describe that as anything other than a pretty awful experience, it did give me some real insights um, that I've been able to use for the rest of my life. The, the, the one occasion I remember above all was when I was picked up one night in a van by a charity who said they would take me to this hostel. It was called The Spike in Peckham. And it was one of these Disney-esque buildings, you know, uh, dark against the, the moonlit sky. And when I arrived, I was shown into this green tiled room. And the first thing that was said to me was, take your clothes off, which I did. The next thing I knew, there was a high powered hose pointed at me. And I felt this small and I escaped back into the streets, incidentally, because I realised then that what I wanted was no accommodation above everything else. What I wanted was to feel significant and valued, that I might have had a backstory, even ambitions. But no one ever asked someone who's homeless what their ambitions are. So it gave me a real insight into communications. But then I reached a particularly low point and I remember saying to myself, a doctor had told me at Charing Cross Hospital that I would be lucky if I lived till, till I was 22. And here I am at 70. So obviously that doctor was thankfully wrong, but I think I changed something in myself uh, as a result of that. And it was, you know, I knew that I was going to go either one way or the other. One way was down, and I didn't have much further to go. The other way was up. So I taught myself this little mantra, the best is yet to come. And amazingly, it has always served me. And I have had many dips. I've lost businesses. I've lost, you know, I've been down there again. And each time I have told myself the best is yet to come. And now when we're in the midst of what is, I think, you know, at its most basic, a difficult situation for us all. We've got, you know, political uncertainty. Uh, we've got COVID. We've got the potential for growing unemployment. I see this as a perfect opportunity, and it kind of mirrors where I was when I was homeless. Uh, this is a perfect opportunity to regather, to rethink, to accelerate some of those things that we thought maybe, maybe not. And I want to go back, first of all, to um, that moment when I said the best is yet to come. A year later, I was busking in Dublin. 
that's me in 1968. Um, and yes, I bust in Dublin. I made friends with Phil Liner um, and the early form of Thin Lizzy. Um, and it taught me that I had something to offer. I was a performer and I could attract audiences. And that was a great learning experience for me. And then, you know, many years later, 50 years later, in fact, I had, you know, made my career as, as a speaker. So that is quite a stretch, isn't it? And the things I've learnt along the way are what guides me now and what the skills I've learnt and the attitudes and the ideas that I've garnered from all that time really does matter in business, in organisations and for individuals and actually for wider society. I am really ambitious for Scotland because I think we are at a point now when you know, we could be looking at changing things at not at a glacial pace, but at a, a frantic pace. So I want to tell you why I, I, I believe that to be true. This is Beirut and it's 2006 and I was there. I arrived two days after the bombing and it was awful. It was awful. Um, it really was, you, you know, you smell it, you breathe in the dust and you see all the accoutrements of, you know, a life normally lived, buried under this concrete. And amidst this mayhem was a man selling clothes on top of the rubble. And I said to my guide, you know, that's very entrepreneurial. And he said, that used to be a shop. So I went and spoke to this guy and I said, it must have been horrible losing your shop. And he said, I'm not a shopkeeper. I give people style and confidence. Wow, that was a real awakening. Because I've realized that what's driven me through all of this is purpose. And I say purpose because what he was saying was the shop is merely a vehicle to be doing what I do to fulfill my purpose. And I said to the guide, that was a real road to Damascus moment for me. And he said, actually, you were on the road to Damascus. It was a extraordinary moment. Um, so purpose is everything. And when people say to me, what's your purpose? I say, well, I want to you know, create a sense of possibility to give people the, the sense that they can achieve anything they want in their life, that they can break through boundaries, that there are no limits. Then... I realize that, you know, at the root of it, you have to be positive. Um, and in Scotland, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but we have a propensity to be a wee bit negative. I mean, when they say arson in America, we say not bad in Scotland. And this is something we've got to change. And I work in schools and I see it beginning to shadow young people, this sense that there are limits to their life that they don't have possibilities that perhaps other children have. And that's something that I work really hard to, uh, to prevent. And I am able to talk to young people and people of all ages and say, look, you have got possibilities. No one has set your life on a path that you cannot change. Um, so positivity is really, really important. And I think that we are getting more confident. I think we're getting more confident. We're getting more positive. And I think that we are at a time now where we've got to try and galvanize people in a really positive way to believe that their destiny is not set in stone and they are part of the economy as it goes forward. The other thing I've learned is creativity. Now I made a business out of creativity and there is no challenge that cannot be addressed by applying a bit of creative thinking. Now I do this with organizations, public services, and it's extraordinary the number of ideas you can extract from people that work within the company or the organization or the public service or the community. I'm gonna give some examples of you know, how creative thinking impacts on some fairly major issues that confront us. The other thing that 
I have learned in this pretty long life that I've lived is, you know, you can do things on your own, but when you collaborate, you can get so much more done. You can get so many more ideas. And you know, they say that diverse organizations are more productive than non-diverse organizations. It's because the more ideas and the more experiences you can pull, the better the outcome. And I've been involved in lots of collaborations. And I'm going to give some examples of collaborations that I've seen that I think are pretty, pretty imaginative. Um, so my proposition is the best is yet to come. Absolutely. This is a time and we needed this time. And I don't mean that in a, in a very negative way. But, you know, sometimes you have to stop and look at what's around you and, you know, rethink it and reset. One of the big issues is undoubtedly climate change. And I think what we're learning now is that climate change really is there. This is real. The deniers are having to retreat because we're seeing evidence around us every day. But do not be despondent because I believe the human capacity to repair um, what's around us is enormous. And, you know, there are ideas from all around the world taking root at the moment, if you excuse the pun. This is a, a wildflower garden in a churchyard in Holland. And the reason it's full of wildflowers is that someone in Holland created a confetti that when you throw it up in the air, it does not litter, it plants wildflower seeds. So you get this. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Um, Google in America, and I think more and more employers around the world are going to be looking at the bicycle. Um, our cities are going to look different. And I don't know if you know, but the, the sale of bikes during the lockdown went up by 40%. So people really are recognizing that this is a means of transport that's fun, that gives you exercise, allows you to breathe the fresh air. The only fresh air um, that's available is when you're out of the cities. And I think we need to be looking at reducing the impact of the car. Um, but I think now is the time to do that. Why not? This is a, a city design in, in America. And there are lots of visualizations of what cities are going to look like. This is a prototype for Chicago. And it shows you um, that, you know, much more greenery, much more greenery. Um, and, you know, carbon free transport, people able to walk um, freely, and there's no motor car in the picture at all. I don't know if this is the perfect image of the future. But what it does show us is that things are changing. The other thing is, you know, we have got so used to packaging um, that we, we expect things to be wrapped in plastic and sometimes in bubble wrap. And, you know, this is a trend that is beginning to grow. I know Edinburgh and Glasgow have got their small shops at the moment that are package free. And it also allows you to buy the quantities of things that you're you're looking for, which for a single man like me living alone is a godsend. In Germany, they've now got supermarkets that are completely zero waste, package free. Uh, so you take your own containers along, you take your own bags along, and you can buy your food and your goods without having to, you know, discard things afterwards and put more plastic in the oceans. Um, greenery is becoming ubiquitous, particularly in Scandinavian countries now. This is in Denmark. And it is, you know, the combination of architecture and design with greenery. And in Scandinavia now, they're planting many forests in Scandinavian cities, in Copenhagen, in Stockholm, and around the smaller towns. And it's amazing because not only are you, you know, adding greenery, but you're also you know, contributing to the, the fresh air. You're contributing to the, the quality of the oxygen. Um, so this makes me really hopeful. Can it be done? Can, for example, Glasgow or Edinburgh make that transformation and make it rapidly? Well, there is proof of this. There's a guy called Jaime Lerner who was an architect. Well, he still is an architect, let's be honest. And he, lives in the city of Curitiba 
in southern Brazil. Now, Curitiba has got 1.8 million people. And he had this passion because the city was full of motor cars, it was polluted, um, you know, people were secondary to the motor car, they had to wait for the motor cars to pass before they could cross the road. There was very little greenery in the city and so on and so forth. So he set out this vision. Now, I mention this because when we talk about purpose, purpose is not a negative thing, it's a positive thing. So a city designed for people is so different, isn't it, from, you know, reduce carbon dioxide. It's not a negative, it's a positive, a city designed for people. People understood what he was talking about and he was able to paint pictures of what the city could look like and how people at every level in society could benefit. And what we have now is a city with the world's best transport system. Not a single individual in Curitiba lives more than 400 metres away from a train, a tram or a bus. That's quite extraordinary. And it's quite a sexy transport system as well because they've got children involved in designing it. The one little impediment was the motorists were a bit undecided about this. In fact, some of them were outright angry and they planned this cavalcade of cars into the city centre as a protest. And when they arrived close to the city centre, there were children on the road drawing pictures of what they wanted the city to look like. That was the end of the protest. Um, every individual has 64.5 square metres for, for them. It's distributed around the city. This is extraordinary. It is really extraordinary because we need more greenery. And Glasgow and Edinburgh are actually very well served, um, as are most Scottish cities. But there are some cities where greenery is a, is a, is a premium. Um, the other thing that I have learnt, and I think Jaime Lorna learnt very early on, you have to make things happen quickly. There is no point in promising things when you go to a process that slows you down, that grinds to a halt. So he asked his operations department, how long will it take to pedestrianise a street? And they said, oh, three months, six months. And he said, no, 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 no. I want it done in 48 hours. Did they do it in 48 hours? Absolutely they did. So here we have an area that has kids wandering freely, people eating sandwiches, um, kids not tethered to their parents, and you know, running about and, and doing what kids do without any fear of the motor car. And all the neighbouring shopkeepers came because the one thing that this pedestrianised area was demonstrating was people were spending more money. So from that, they created the largest pedestrian precinct in the world. One of the challenges, because, you know, you can't just simply lay out a plan and expect everyone to fit in with it. And Jaime Lerner needed people to start recycling their waste. And he went to the slum dwellers the notorious favelas in, in Brazil. And of course, there people are living on the edge of, you know, poverty, just constantly, you know, living from day to day, not knowing where the next meal is going to come from. And he said to them, look, I want you to recycle all your waste. But of course, that occupied a very low priority with people in their situation. So he said, but in exchange, I will give you food and football tickets. I don't know if football tickets would work in Edinburgh, but certainly in Brazil, no one can afford to go to the football who's not in the upper echelons of the earning um, cohort. So this worked. People realised that they were getting something in exchange for the recycling. But then he said, I want you to rebuild homes and I want you to train up to be in the construction industry, I want you to learn the skills and help to design your own housing. And they did. So now 60% of the lower income people are involved in what is a pretty lucrative construction industry. Um, so here we have a city of 1.8 million people that has been transformed. It has been transformed 
GDP has gone up, average earnings have gone up, pollution is right down, 98% of its population want to live in Curitiba for the rest of their life. But in 1997, there was a survey done that showed that 70% of the citizens of Sao Paulo also went to live in Curitiba for the rest of their life. That's a success story, a real success story. And it took one man with a vision to start making it happen, to get people excited, to involve people at every level of community. And of course, the business community came on board because they saw the benefits to them. But he was asked, how did he make it happen without huge budgets? And he said something really interesting. So said, there's three things. One, take a zero off the budget and you've got creativity. Take two zeros off the budget, you've got genuine sustainability. But, he said, you have to beat off the complexity sellers. And we all know what they are. Those people that always find a reason not for doing something. Those people that want to set up a process to ensure that this is going to be taken a long time, that's going to go at a glacial pace. Real positive learning from that experience. One of the things that, you know, with people working at home now, it does not displace the workplace, but the workplace might change. This is an office in London that's been redeveloped. And what it shows is that, you know, the workplace can become something more than just simply lined with desks. I mean, Google do this really well. The workplace is a place of fun. Uh, I've seen some extraordinary things around the world. And uh, by the way, I visited Curitiba and I met Mayor Haibi Lerner. So I know that this whole thing is about creativity. It's about looking at what can be done to solve problems. Now, the workplace um, is going to become somewhere where people go perhaps once or twice a week, apart from you know, critical office industries where you know, people need to work together. I was speaking to someone yesterday who works for the Mental Welfare Commission, and they take calls. They each take a day uh, taking calls. And these calls can be really difficult to deal with. Really some very heartbreaking stories they're listening to and some very anxious uh, people. And in the office, they get to share their anxiety. They get to talk about it. But at home, they're not getting that. So there are some advantages with working at home and there are some disadvantages. So the workplace, as we know it, must become somewhere that's slightly different from what we know just now. This is um, the city of Tirana in Albania, a city that was until, you know, a few years ago, battleship grey. And the mayor who was elected was called Eddie Rama. He was an artist. You see, here we have an architect in Curitiba and an artist in Tirana. And he asked people, what can I do to make life better for you? I don't have a huge amount of money. And they said, we want more color, we want more trees, and we want our civic spaces cleared up. He delivered them that. They found a palette of colors and they painted all around the city. They planted 15,000 trees and they cleared up the civic spaces. Now, one thing that no one had ever calculated into this was that one of the impacts of that would be that crime came down quite dramatically. So here we've got a correlation between neighbourhoods, colour and crime. How, how brilliant a discovery that is, that crime is not simply about, you know, tackling, um, you know, making things difficult for criminals. It's also about creating an environment that encourages people towards a different behavior. This is in Japan, and it's, uh, I, some of you might have seen this recently. This is a new toilet design, and it's in a park in Japan, in Tokyo. And this toilet works like this. It's transparent, as you can see. Not much of an incentive to go inside, is it? But when you go in and you clog the door, it becomes opaque. So, I just think it's lovely because it's a presence in a park. At night, it's all lit up and it's very colourful. You know, design, creativity, these things are really important as we move forward because 
we know we're uplifted by design because it really does work. Language, sculpture in Italy, the language of art is an extraordinary thing. I want this in Leith, but I haven't found the means by which to provide it. But it's just extraordinary because what is happening here is someone has created a sculpture that breaks the landscape, that just draws people towards it. So neighbourhoods in this part of Italy is drawing thousands of people daily. So that's created a new industry. It's created all sorts of little, um, you know, objects, dar, that people can take away with them because this is an attraction. It's opened up cafes, it's opened up restaurants, it's opened up, you know, tourist opportunities that were never there before. This is in Dresden. And this is a wall. I mean, remember Dresden was you know, pretty badly bombed during the war. And this is in an area of the city that's not particularly wealthy. So what have they done? They've painted it beautiful colours, they've rendered it um, in a really stylish way. And you can see the piping there and you think, what's that for? When it plays, this wall plays music. It's quite extraordinary. I mean, I mentioned this in Glasgow, someone said, I will never stop playing music if you do that, it will drive us mad. But the point here is, they've created an attraction, something that draws people not just from around Germany, from around the world. So it's an economic generator, bit of creativity. And that did not take much. You know, language and imagery becomes important. You know, I always say that Martin Luther King did not stand on the mountain in Washington all those years ago and say, I have a strategic plan. He said, I have a dream. And, you know, we have got a language around us that's pretty corporate, that's pretty um, sometimes destructive. We inadvertently communicate the wrong message. I mention this because I was in East Lothian um, working for the council a few years ago and they wanted a communications plan that, you know, began to you know, get people involved, began to, you know, enliven democracy. But what I found out was actually a plan for the councillors to get more votes. And I found this out because I said, look, I want to go and speak to young people about, you know, their views of the council and what their ambitions and their ideas for the area were. And he said, this is the head of the council, he said, oh, I don't know about that, they don't vote yet. So anyway, I got permission to do that. And I was in a school in Trenent and I had the council logo, you know, facing towards me and I got them warmed up. This is a second year class. And I turned over the card and there was the East Lothian Council logo and I said, what does that say to you? And this wee boy put his hand up and he said, no ball games, mister. So here we have, you know, a whole generation of young people that think the council is there to stop them doing something. When I told the councillors that, they were just gobsmacked. But it's true, isn't it? We have all this information around us and it can become instructional. And, you know, children see that in a different way from adults, because adults see it as guiding us, because we've got used to this negative language. Children don't, they see it in the raw. They see it as it actually is. So this is an example of how you can incentivize and provide a bit of fun around the fun of, of washing your hands. Um, this is a design done by Studio LR, my friends in Edinburgh, and this is the proposal for a children's hospital. Why not say it as it is? You know, instead of, you know, using the language of medicine, use the language of the consumer so they understand what it is. It's also a wee bit funny, isn't it? And it, it lifts the spirits. By the way, in, in Montreal, the, they brought in a creative agency to work with a hospital. It was a children's hospital. And they found out some amazing things. And they were able to help reduce the stay in hospital and improve outcomes for patients by doing two things. One was children are very anxious when they arrive in the hospital. It's a hostile environment. Of course it is. And even if you've got a parent, you know, staying by your bedside, it feels like an alien environment. 
So what they discovered was that if they took a film of the child's bedroom and showed it at the end of the bed, the child relaxed much more quickly. The other impediment to you know, children feeling relaxed were the implements that doctors used, you know, stethoscopes, needles, all these things that look incredibly frightening to a child, they created a, a cartoon that showed all these implements as friendly characters. You know, simple. That reduced times in the hospital. So it actually improved the hospital's um, ability to budget. Creativity. Can we really tackle those things that beset us? One of the big things that we've never addressed in all the years, because cars get faster and faster and faster, is the issue of speeding. And speeding is, you know, something we want to tackle. And we've always tackled it in a very particular way, which is, you know, putting signs up with a speed limit and then having cameras to catch people. And then we find them. But it doesn't work because people have worked out you know, where the cameras are and so forth. We all know what happens. But we do know that the smiley face works better than a speed camera because it gives people a positive affirmation. Now, a young guy in America called Kevin Richardson had this idea to tackle speeding. And he tried to sell it in America and he tried to sell it in Britain. And they said, no, we've got our own systems. But in Stockholm, they said, we like this idea. So what, how it works is simple. If you're going under the speed limit in Stockholm, a big sign flashes up and it says, thank you, you've been entered for the speed lottery draw. And if you're going over the speed limit, it says, thank you, you've contributed to the speed lottery draw because it, it captures the registration number on your number plate. So here is an idea that came from a 17 year old. And the impact was speeding came down by an average of 22%. That is extraordinary, isn't it? Now, the other thing I've talked about is, is collaboration. And there are some great examples of collaboration. You know, um, if you think of, you know, uh, Spotify and Uber have formed a collaboration. So if you get into an Uber car, you can put your own music on in the car and the driver just has to like a lump it because after all, you're able to rate the driver. There's lots of them. There's, there's one that I remember, it was between, um, I think it was Reebok and Cirque Soleil. Cirque Soleil. And Reebok, you know, was able to design clothing that was dancewear. So it gave both brands a huge bush, uh, boost. Um, but I want to talk about one example of collaboration that is really quite inspiring. And it is based on this proposition. Who do we get to design children's playgrounds? It's adults, isn't it? Professional designers. But in, in one part of America, they asked the children, do you want to design a playground for your neighborhood? And of course, the children said, yes. There's no hesitation. They don't see where's the budget coming from. They're not cynical. All they see is possibility and they get down to it and they design this beautiful playground. And of course, there was a professional designer watching, making no comment. And then they brought the professional designer to negotiate with the, ch the, the children. You know, what can, what can I do to add some value to this? playground and there were a few things he saw that he could make adjustments to one was spatial because the kids had no real recognition of how things would be spaced out um so we would say you know for example if you're coming down this swing do you want to be bumping into someone coming down that beautiful shoot that you've designed the kids said actually we do but they managed to negotiate so they made a few adjustments then they brought engineering students in from the nearby college and they asked them to see if they could add value to this playground as well. The result is a children's playground designed by the children and therefore owned by the local community. And my God, you will not get near that children's playground if you've got any ill intent. But every time a child uses it, it generates electricity for the local community. That's a brilliant example of collaboration. So these are the themes. 
that I want you to think about. And there are so many stories I've got about everything that I have talked about is being brought to life around the world in pockets. And in Scotland, we've got some brilliant examples. Retail is going to change. Look at the Scottish Design Exchange in Buchanan Galleries in Glasgow, or it's moving into George Street in Edinburgh. And uh, here is our retail model where artists can display their products and they pay a small rent for the space and they get 100% of the profits. They don't have to do any of the selling of it. They don't have to do any of the business stuff around it because that's done for them. It's a brilliant idea. And I think they've made something like three million pounds for artists, for 300 artists over the last three years. That's an extraordinary model. We've got a center stage in Kilmarnock that is doing quite extraordinary things, um, using the arts at the center. And we have seen performances that are just devastatingly brilliant by people from the local community. It won Theatre of the Year in 2018. They set up a food service so that they've got chefs, proper chefs, taking food from the local community, from the local uh, growers, and using excess food from the supermarkets and turning it into haute cuisine. And they call that eating with dignity because food banks don't give people dignity. And they're also working with prisoners in Kilmarnock Prison. And for an investment of £265,000, they're getting a return to the local economy of £5.5 million. One of the best lines I've heard in recent years was a, a prisoner who was very reluctant to do anything um, in front of other people. And he was persuaded to sing. And he stood up and he sang this song. And of course, he got a huge round of applause. And he couldn't find a word for what he was feeling. And he says, I don't know what to call this. He said, I think it's a legal high. That's a legal high. You know, there are so many people outside their economy. I want to bring them inside of the economy. And we're all part of this because now there has never been a better time to look at what we do as businesses, what we do as public services, what we do as individuals, to find that ambition and to think we can make it happen. And we're going to use creativity. We've got a purpose. We're going to use a positive attitude and we're going to collaborate in a way that we've never done before. That's my number. for me at any time you want. Um, it'll come up again in the future, but I think I'm gonna hand back to, to David um, to see if there are any questions that might have come up during my presentation, which I hope was okay. Um, and it might allow me to expand on things. Mate. So, thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was an absolutely fantastic inspiring and thought-provoking talk. Um, th there are a, a, a number of questions across a, a number of themes um, that were identified oh. throughout um, the, the, the last 40 minutes um, that I think we kind of want to touch on, try and expand on a, a little bit. And a lot of your examples that you used really lend themselves to the, the idea of, of community. Absolutely. And you know, how can we in Scotland and in the UK, and you know, particularly just now when we're being urged to minimise our social contacts, mm -hmm. give ourselves a, a greater community identity. Well, I think one of the things that we've, we've I like neighbourhoods of distinction. And I put together lots of um, proposals around this, one in Burnley, um, one in Manchester. And, you know, this, the, there is no, reason why any neighborhood can't establish some kind of differentiating theme. And then you can bring in the creatives, you can get people locally involved in it, you can create employment. I was in the east end of Glasgow and I asked this question, you know, don't ask people what can we do to improve your area because it's been asked again, how can we make it more inclusive? That's a language people don't really recognize. And, you know, when someone comes to your door and says, I'm a financial inclusion officer, you think, what do you mean? Are you going to help me get money? Are you a money advisor? Yes. So how can we turn neighbourhoods into 
really distinctive areas. So that when you walk into it, there's a different atmosphere. There's something unique about it. Well, um, I asked this question, you know, how are you going to turn this area into a tourist destination? No one ever asked them that. So you can see from Curitiba, from Tirana, uh, from all sorts of things that are going around the world, that you can take any neighbourhood, you can create something that is unique to that neighbourhood. Now, if you get people involved in that, you create a cohesion. But it starts with this purpose, you know, and the purpose has got to be something more than we're going to regenerate the area. That's a process. Um, we want to become, you know, a place that people want to visit and enjoy. That's different because it creates a different kind of energy. So I think that, you know, the social distancing thing, yeah, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate, but it's allowed people to, you know, think about their lives and think about what's around them in a way that they haven't before. Because, you know, Highland, NHS Highland says, you know, uh, it's now prescribing nature as part of its service to patients. Now, that's easy when you live in the Highlands, in this beautiful environment. But when you're living in some of the urban environments that I go around and see, that's not a very, dis, you know, um, incentivizing prospect, is it? To go and go outside and walk around. So we need to create, you know, at its foundation, um, an assumption that every person should be able to walk around the neighborhood safely and see things and enjoy things that are you know distinctive to their neighborhood so this is a great time for community cohesion but we need the big thinkers to be you know leading it we've got a question in from uh, lisa at flexibility works who says you, you talked about the changing face of work and the concept of a thing that we do the idea of purpose rather than a place that we go um, and she's interested in your views on how flexible working can be further embedded into society in Scotland and what you think the benefits will be to people and to businesses. Well, look, I've been an employer and I had very high um, retention rates. I had very low absenteeism rates. And someone asked me what it was I did. And I just said, look, um, these are human beings. I want them to live their life. And the more they live their life outside work, as well as inside work, the more they've got to contribute. So we know this from, say, Microsoft. Microsoft did a four-day week with uh, you know, a proportion of their company. And <laughs> productivity went up 40%. Uh, Google does a four-day week, and it gives the, 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 the remaining day... Uh, a chance for people to go and explore things and you know, come back with ideas to the company. Um, and I think that when you've got someone at work who is there because they want to be at work, because they've got a purpose, you're halfway there. If you start putting constraints and rules and regulations and time limits, you know, Google, um, they do really well from, the, from their people. But um, Virgin Airlines... You know, Virgin stopped people having holidays. They stopped, you know, holiday allowance. They said, if you want to go on holiday, go on holiday. You just tell us. And it's extraordinary, isn't it? That you can free people. People are adults. People are, you know, they want to work, but they don't want their work to consume them. They don't want it to be, you know, something that gives them anxiety. I think we've got a huge way to go with flexible working. And I think we're just seeing now this idea that you have to be in the office, you have to be seen, you have to be first in has gone and people are more productive at home. So I think flexible working is going to become something that's really embedded in the way we think about the future. It's here, it's now, it's going to happen. Um, again, we've got another question in for, from Malcolm Curry, um, which again is along the, the well-being theme. Um, Malcolm says that he's passionate about collaborative approaches in the workplace, particularly around staff involvement, um, but he's finding few employers thinking of that as an approach to surviving, thriving as we grow from lockdown. So do you, Mike, have any, any ideas on how to engage employers more, more actively? Well, um, I, I, I mean, this is what I'm trying to do, is, is, is to work with employers uh, and say, look, we can get, you know, the solutions will come from within your organization. Um, and also get employers together and say, look, 
together we can work out you know some big ideas and and you know one of the things that happens with collaborations as we know them in in Scotland just now and I'll just tell you this because uh, it is something we have to work on a, a true collab we use the word partnership a lot um, but partnership is a fairly benign word collaboration is an active word you can when you say you're going to partner someone, it doesn't really fill you full of enthusiasm and excitement and energy. But if you say collaborate, it's, it's a more active verb. But what we found, and I was in Toronto, and the guy that held up the cultural strategy there said, you know, what people were doing, they were coming in and they were representing their organization or their department or themselves. He says, what we had to do was take them out of that. So he said, if you've come to represent your organization, we don't want you here. So there's too many egos. There's too many, this is what we do. This is what I do. You know, I work in the accounts department, so I'm looking at everything from an accounts perspective. No, throw off all of that. You know, collaborations should start with a blank sheet of paper and should be a creative process. And we can come up with all kinds of things that really work for us. And you know, the business community has to work collaboratively now. And, you know, they have to get their employees engaged in finding out, you know, what the future might hold. Because the employees, their staff will have ideas. And when they work with other businesses, you get so many more ideas than when someone tries to do it alone. Uh, we've got two, one comment and one question and that relates back to your, your anecdotes that you mentioned just around, around town and city planning. Um, there was a, an honest comment that came in said inspirational um, as, an, as an environmental advisor for the past 20 years, I oh. think identified exactly how town and city planning in the UK and beyond should be done. Um, and then we've got a question in from, from, from Kelvin Donaldson as well around the same topic. And this might goes back to your comments around the, 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 the naysayers and the complexity sellers as well. Mm -hmm. um, Kelvin lives in South Edinburgh, um, and as you might know, cycling, pedestrian, priority routes in Morningside, um, they've been greeted by a chorus of howls by the community and by car owners that travel into the city centre. And what you say about positivity rings very true. Um, but the way that this seems to have been pre presented is in a preventative manner rather than positive. And, you know, the, implement the implementation might be ugly, piecemeal, half-hearted, but it's also been very criticised and, you know, implemented without much consultation and seen as maybe undemocratic, you know, how do you counter that criticism while avoiding the, you know, other under ambitious compromise solutions? Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, what, you, what, what you've said is, is right. What, what happens is it becomes piecemeal and it becomes a preventive thing rather than, you know, a big picture. If you were to sell what this is going to look like, for people, what it's going to feel like, how it's going to help to grow the economy in a way that doesn't impact on the environment in a negative way. Um, it's, and what kind of future our children should look forward to. Then that's a different proposition from, we're now going to close this route. You know, cars won't be allowed to go here. I live in Leith and Leith just now is like, uh, it's a bit like Beirut, to be honest, when I went to visit there. Um, every road is dug up. Um, and it wasn't done with consultation. The consultation was after the fact. You know, uh, we're going to be closing Constitution Street for, you know, a year, 18 months. You know, saying that to shopkeepers who depend on business, saying it to a garage owner who gets cars coming into his garage. So it's got to start with a vision. And, you know, I, I love the, 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 the word play in creating a vision. And it has got to be more than we're going to be doing this. It's got to be about this is where we're going to be when we all, you know, come together. And this is the most exciting thing that's happened, you know, in this area. And we will be leading the rest of the UK. Um, there's a, an architect in uh, Copenhagen um, called Gell Architects. It's G-H-E-L-L, -L, single L. And they do stuff all over the world, and it really is breathtaking. I mean, you know, multi-storey uh, farms, urban farms. You know, you've seen the ski slope on the top of the, the houses in, in Denmark. And what they're doing is they're saying everything we design is around well-being. You know, it's, it's well-being. And we know that people um, will respond to 
this whole notion of creating an environment in which they feel better. Um, and they do some imaginative stuff. But the thing is, the head of design at Gell Architects is from Lanithko. So we had to go to Denmark, you know, to fulfill his ambition. And that's absurd. So there is a resource, you know, bring David Gill back from Gell Architects to his home country and say, look, my friend, all the things you've learned, you know, bring it back to Scotland because we need people who don't have this, well, that won't work. Or, you know, we'll have to tell people and they call it a period of consultation. I hate the period of consultation because the only people that ever really talk are the very confident middle class people. They'll be the ones up there first. Um, and so you get a kind of skewed um, response from the community anyway. This is a time when, you know, creating big visions and being, you know, fast in doing things and delivering and getting school kids involved right from the very outset. That kind of leads on to my, my next question um, and changing tax slightly to talk about the possibilities for young people, which you touched on in, in your anecdotes. And, you know, I think we're seeing from, you know, our own examples just out and about and also from the news that there's a lot of young people who are being disproportionately disadvantaged in their careers and personally by the, by the pandemic. Um, and for those of you listening just now, you may not know, but Mike wrote a, a blog for, for us on, on the Brodies website uh, for the No Wrong Path initiative. Um, which was around the possibilities for, for young people. And if you haven't read that, I would urge you to go and read it. If you Google Mike Stevenson Brodies and hashtag No Wrong Path, you'll be able to find it on the Brodie site. But, but Mike, what is your, your message for, for young people just now who may be facing difficulty? Well, I mean, I, I do get a chance to talk to young people. And I, I got a few teachers that have phoned up and said, you know, could we have a Zoom call with a young person in their class? I mean, this is all very confidential. But the thing that um, I talk about is not the environment, not what's happening. I talk about them as an individual. So to focus on them as, you know, someone that is unique, someone that is born with, you know, unique qualities and unique interests and unique passions. And I talk about, you know, learning, um, learning, experiencing um, as being the roots to growth. And, you know, you can talk to a young person, but they'll only listen if you're talking to them as an individual. So I, I speak to, um, for example, I was in Drum Chapel High School last year. And, you know, you get, kids are quite anxious when someone of my age, I mean, I'm 70 for goodness sake, stands up to talk to them. And I don't think I listened to a 70 year old when I was 13, 14. But anyway, I stood up and I said, by the way, um, see when people say to you, these are the best days of your life. That's crap. They're not. The best is yet to come. And I start talking about, you know, what, what happened to me and the fact that, you know, everything I did was just uh, an experience. Every job I took, was an experience, I learned something from it. So it's really about opening up their minds to the fact that they might have much more control over their destiny. And you know, often you find that the, the, the children have the hardest time at school are the entrepreneurs, which is, is, is really crazy. Um, and you know, how do you use that disadvantage that you think you've got and turn it into an advantage? And I've got so many stories around that. I've been working with a young guy in Kilmarnock well, young, He's, he, uh, he was declared brain dead 15 months ago. So he was lying in hospital, uh, been in drugs and alcohol, you know, all the attendant problems of someone who's going through a difficult time. Um, and I've been coaching him to tell his story because he came back to life and he's now a writer. He's a wordsmith. I mean, he is a brilliant writer. And I, I coached him to present his story. So he went and spoke to the parliament who um, were influenced by his whole story because his message was, you know, anyone could do what I'm doing. I couldn't believe I could actually write stuff and now I'm doing it because someone had sparked that in him. If that idea hadn't been planted into his head, it might never have happened. So that's what we've got to do with. And I've been trying to get money 
for the last few years to go out and get young people to tell their stories, ones that have made you know, this little bit of progress, ones that have come out of some difficulty and done something with their life. I want to get these stories, I want to get them on film, and I want to get them to inspire other young people. Because someone of my age can't inspire a young person. So say, it wasn't like, you know, you never had COVID. It's true, we didn't. And I wasn't around in the war, so I can't even talk about that. Well, I, I must say, Mike, um, you know, I, I think uh, the best is yet to come is, a, is an absolutely fantastic mantra. And we're being asked in the chat here, um, but by an anonymous attendee, if, if there's going to be any chance of you standing for Parliament because they will vote for you. So perhaps um, the best is yet to come if you do decide that to be your manifesto. <laughs> yeah, the trouble with Parliament is it's a party based system. And I'm, I'm a bit like Groucho Marx, you know, any club that accepts me um, must be very, very suspect. You know, I, but I think outside politics is where the drive and the ideas will come. And I think sometimes we, we make this mistake of thinking that politics is about ideas. It's not. Politics is about representation. And we've got the ideas. We should be putting stuff to Parliament. But we need more of us to get together to do this. Well, Mike, I'm, I'm conscious of the time just now. And this has been an absolutely you know, fascinating and you know, in, in, insightful um, talk over the last hour or so. And we would love very much like to thank you for your time um, and to thank uh, everyone for, uh, for, for, for joining us today. Um, there will be a recording of today's event that's, uh, that will be sent out to, to delegate lists. So if you missed anything or you want to try and pick up on any of the concepts again, um, that will be landing in your inbox. Um, and as I say, I'm sure we will work together again in the in the future. Um, so if everyone can give, give a big uh, virtual round of applause for Mike Stevenson this afternoon. Mike, thanks very much for your time. My pleasure.